My favorite trace element is selenium. Selenium is an essential trace element for humans. This means that if we don't have selenium in the diet, in our diet we would die. And uh, it's a trace element in the periodic table uh, of elements it sits below sulfur. So chemically it's very similar to sulfur. However, it also has unique, unique properties and unique features. So why is selenium so important, uh, being a trace element? First description of selenium probably comes from the from the travel of Marco Polo when he traveled to China and his horses ate uh, some, some plant and suddenly died. So we think that the reason they died because they ate plants which accumulate selenium. Now we know certain plants they accumulate selenium to protect themselves from being eaten by insects and, and other animals. So for many, for many years, for uh, centuries, selenium was thought to be a toxic element. There are some diseases associated with selenium uh, toxicity, for example, white muscle disease um, and other diseases. And it was surprised when in the 90s, 1950s, there was a study which found that one factor, dietary factor, was helping against uh, cirrhosis, uh, liver cirrhosis. And that factor was identified as dietary selenium, so it was quite surprising. So then in the, in the, in the 70s, uh, one protein was found, glutathione peroxidase, which was found to contain selenium. And then the form of selenium in selenoproteins was found uh, to be a selenocysteine. So now we call this the 21st amino acid. So if you open any textbook, then you find that proteins are composed of 20 amino acids, but actually it's not true. There is a 21st one. And that 21st amino acid is present, you know, is needed in humans. In some proteins it's used, and those proteins are important. That's why selenium is important. So what are these proteins? We contributed to this area. So actually, when I started my lab, we were quite interested in identifying selenoprotein genes. And I had a very talented a graduate student in my lab, Gregory Krukov, who developed a, a, a program to identify these uh, uh, proteins, or I would say genes, which code for selenium-containing proteins, by searching for RNA structures. And then we found that the human genome has 25 genes which code for selenoprotein genes. Out of these 25, several happen to be essential selenoprotein genes. And so now we study uh, some of these proteins. Uh, we know function for about half of these proteins. We still, don't, we, we still don't know what the other half, 12 or 13 proteins do. But even uh, by knowing the function of 12 proteins, we already know that the trace element is very important. So one of the proteins, actually, uh, one of the first proteins we found, we call it selenoprotein R, and we just picked up a letter from the alphabet R and called it selenoprotein R, because there are also other proteins that we, which we named, like selenoprotein T, selenoprotein S, K, M, O, and so on. So later, we found the function of the protein, and uh, apparently it's an antioxidant protein. It protects uh, oxidatively damaged proteins. Uh, damaged proteins can be oxidatively damaged, and the protein is a repair protein. It can remove that oxidative damage by reducing oxidized methanin. So the protein is actually called methanin r sulfoxide reductase. And the interesting thing is that there was a, quite a coincidence because we call it R, and later we found that it reduces specifically the R uh, stereomere of methanin sulfoxide. It was a nice coincidence. So there are other proteins which contain selenium are called thyroidoxin reductases. In mammals, there are three thyroidoxin reductases, and all three are selenium-containing proteins. So this means that the entire thyroidoxin system is dependent on selenium. And the thyroidoxin system, what it does, it controls the redox state of cysteines in proteins. It's a pretty important function. Three of the proteins are thyroid hormone deadenases. This means that the entire uh, function of thyroid hormone is dependent on selenium. And you know, five proteins are called glutathione peroxidases. These are enzymes which remove hydrogen peroxide. So these are functions which are quite important, and they explain why selenium is so important in biology. After humans, we applied this program and similar approaches to a number of other organisms. Now we find we found that, for example, mouse has 24 such proteins, or fly, Drosophila, only three, or C. elegans, which is a nematode, only one. And that one protein has only one selenocysteine residue. So the entire system for biosynthesis of selenocysteine is used to insert one residue into one protein. And apparently it's, it's still important. Other interesting things that happen uh, by applying uh, this approach is that 
uh, we could identify selenium protein genes in hundreds of thousands of organisms. And we found that terrestrial organisms have fewer selenium proteins than aquatic organisms. We still don't know for sure why this is the case. Our hypothesis is that it's because of oxygen. Oxygen content is a little bit lower in, in the water than, than in air, and so um, that oxygen is a little bit more damaging for terrestrial organisms. So we could link this to uh, habitat and, and geography and, and, and you know, these genomic approaches to various other, various other systems. It's also interesting that um, uh, that the biosynthesis of the 20 amino acids uh, was already known for 40 to 50 years, but how selenocysteine is synthesized, uh, at least in mammals, was only discovered about five years ago. And we contributed to that study by identifying two proteins which are involved in the process. One is called phosphoserial TRNA ki uh, kinase and the other one selenocysteine synthase. So it's interesting that selenocysteine is synthesized on its own TRNA and that uh, several proteins are involved, and that tRNA then binds to selenocysteine specific elongation factor. So 20 amino acids have one elongation factor, but selenocysteine has its own elongation factor. And, and then it's inserted in the proteins. And in proteins, it's not just inserted in any position, but it's always inserted in the most important position. This, all of these selenium-containing proteins are enzymes. They all oxidase reductases. And once we identify a new selenoprotein gene, we already know that this must be an oxidoreductase and selenocysteine must be present in the active site, being the most important residue, redox residue. Not only it's important for us to study uh, the role of selenium in biology, because you know, once we find a protein, let's say uh, protein disulfide embrace, and we find that it contains selenium, then we can infer that that, that particular function forming disulfide bonds is dependent on selenium and, and so on. So this helps us to understand biology of selenium. Not only that, but we can use selenium to, uh, to solve some other problems in biology. For example, we've been interested in identifying catalytic redox active systems. So some proteins, they use cysteine for redox catalysis to oxidize or reduce something. And uh, many such proteins were known, but it's unclear how many such proteins exist. Is it 10 or 100, 1,000 in each genome? So we used selenium or selenocysteine to address that question. By aligning the two proteins and finding situations when selenocysteine corresponds to cysteine in other proteins, we were able to find those catalytic reductive, redox active cysteines on a genome-wide scale. So we identified more than 100 such proteins in humans, or about 50 such proteins in, in yeast. And, 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 you know, and more than 200 proteins in plants. And so we can study them or study the, the redox biology in general with the help of selenocysteine. Another example that in which selenocysteine was quite helpful is the understanding of the genetic code. Several years ago, we uh, been studying an organism called Euplotis crassus. It's a ciliate, small unicellular organism. And uh, the interesting thing is that in that organism, a codon TGA codes for cysteine. So this was important for us because we already knew that TGA normally codes for selenocysteine. The typical function of the TGA codon is a stop to terminate protein synthesis, but in, um, in organisms also codes for selenocysteine. But in the Euplotis, it's a cysteine. So the question is, how about selenocysteine? Is it also encoded in that organism, then how is it possible that one codon can code for two different amino acids? Since the genetic code was discovered, um, it was known that, for example, if uh, TGC uh, codon, uh, well, UGC uh, in the RNA form, codes for cysteine, that means that UGC would code, any UGC would code for cysteine in any of the gene in that particular organism. But here we find a potential case when one codon might code for two different amino acids. So we studied that, that question, we sequenced the genome, and we indeed found, indeed found that this particular codon codes for two different amino acids. We identified a mechanism for that. It turns out that the RNA, the RNA structure in the untranslated region can reprogram uh, the ribosome so that it can code for one or the other amino acid. This might happen even if within the same gene not just in, in other genes. This is also important because uh, it gives uh, the first example of a situation when one codon code codes for two different amino acids. And it's possible that there are more cases like that.
so as you can see, selenium is a quite useful and important um, trace element. It's uh, used in very small amounts. Uh, it's present in various foods, in seafoods in particular. Brazil nut is a good source of selenium. Many people ask me whether I use selenium in my diet or not. And it's funny because if you go to conferences and talk to people who study vitamin D, they, they often take vitamin D. And researchers who study vitamin E, they use vitamin E. I don't take selenium. <laughs> I think we don't know enough whether, uh, we know a lot, but we still don't know enough to, to know whether it's truly helpful or not. It's best known for its role in cancer prevention. There have been study, um, very much publicized study, um, which found that selenium can reduce the risk of prostate cancer about threefold. However, more recent studies found no effect of selenium. And in fact, some of the studies that found that, that a little bit higher level of selenium might even promote diabetes without any effect of cancer, on cancer. So as a result, uh, we, we have many studies with positive effect and studies with no effect. So we really need to understand better, better the fundamental biology of selenium before selenium can be actually used. Uh, as a dietary supplement. We are still interested in many questions in the area of selenium. I think uh, uh, one critical question is to find the functions of those 12 or 13 selenium-containing proteins in humans. So as I, as I mentioned uh, earlier in this conversation, we only know function, functions about half of such proteins. So once we know what they do, we can better explain those processes and, and explain what selenium exactly does when we change selenium in the diet. I think now we have quite good tools to study selenium. We have uh, these genomic approaches uh, and the programs which we use are quite reliable so we can efficiently identify selenium protein genes in a variety of, organism, of organisms. This is in contrast to other trace elements, um, for example, copper or zinc. Those are more abundant trace elements, but it's unclear how many proteins, not, on, not all proteins are known which bind uh, those particular trace elements. In the case of selenium, it's pretty clear which proteins bind because we, we, we have these genomic signatures. And so once we find, we can find selenium protein genes. It's really a big help for us and uh, which allows us to uh, link selenium to a variety of biological processes.